right now it's uh, again Professor Case van der Vleuten who is going to uh, uh, present the keynote speech and uh, it's on assessment of the future. Is it on? Yes. The next thing is a slightly more abstract, I'm afraid. A little bit more difficult. But I'm glad I am, was able to sort of uh, give you the underlying notions, because that's what it's based on. I will talk about the whole notion of compromises in assessment, uh, and then about um, how to design an assessment program. Because virtually there's hardly anything about it in the literature. And I'll propose a certain model of longitudinal assessment. And I'll come to a conclusion. Um, compromise. A long time ago, I published a paper where I said that every instrument has a set of characteristics, reliability, validity, educational consequences, uh, learning impact, resources, the costs, uh, whether uh, a measure is accepted or not within the community, and other publications have shown other characteristics of instruments. And I thought, if Professor Harden can produce a nice formula, I can do that too, because I thought the utility of any particular method is a function of these different quality characteristics. And the whole notion of, of, of compromise is that you can't have it all. You don't have an endless budget. You can't have perfect reliability. There's always a compromise of validity. So you can't have it all. And depending what the function is of the method in a total program, you may compromise differently. For example, if we talk about a high-stakes certification examination that allows you to go into postgraduate training, then we won't compromise on reliability. Because we might actually be sued in court if we make false positive, false, false negative decisions. So there's always a compromise. And we put different weights given the different functions of the assessment in the total program. Where do we compromise? Well, um, I think we compromise everywhere in practice. And let me take the three, reliability, validity, and educational impact. And we've been discussing the notion of reliability, right? And here we're talking about the reliability of total scores. If we talk about the reliability of partial scores for feedback reasons, profile scores, the situation gets even very much worse. So that most of the information that we then provide for this individual moment is not very reliable. So we make huge compromises on reliability in our assessment for individual methods. Validity, if I look at educational practice, I see a dominant practice of methods in the lower parts of Miller's pyramid. Fortunately, things are changing, but I think, particularly in the old days, we did most things at the lower end of middle pyramid, knowledge exams. And if I look at educational practice, if I look at the knowledge exams, they're often at the bottom layer as well, pure factual knowledge and nothing much more. So in practice, I think we compromise on a lot in terms of validity. And yes, even Einstein already said not everything that counts, uh, the quantitative part, can be measured. Not everything that can be measured can, be, can count. And I'll come back to that later on. A lot of things that we find very important in medical training, which are difficult to measure, but that's no excuse not to assess them. And in the past, we've been not assessing them, I think, too much. If we look at modern outcome systems, 
then you have different systems across the world, across the globe. And I, I've listed three outcome systems here. Uh, one from the US, one from Canada, and one from UK. And all countries, and I, I understand Sweden is working on them as well, is working on these sort of outcome systems. I think we're moving from an input model of education, so many hours of anatomy, so many hours of physiology, so much of internal medicine, six weeks of clerkships to that dis discipline. We're moving towards an output model. And we define the competencies that we want our graduates to, to have, and then we cater the education program towards that. That's where we're going. Interestingly, these outcome systems have been designed with the input from various stakeholders, including patients, but also employers. And interestingly is this, I think. That is, we move beyond the knowledge paradigm, beyond the medical expertise only. There's a lot of emphasis on more, what I would call more generic skills. Skills, um, you know, a lawyer should be a good communicator as well. Um, an emphasis on difficult concepts, constructs, mm -hmm. which are not easy to assess. And actually, most of these constructs, you cannot assess without some direct observation and judgment. So we have to rely on judgment, on professional judgment, to say anything about these more complex competencies. By the way, the emphasis on these competencies are very important. Also, because of research, research has indicated that whenever things go wrong in clinical practice, these kind of competencies are involved. If you look at the hospital complaints in my university, 80% of the hospital complaints are related to communication. There's good research showing that naturally the access to the labor market is defined by your specific competencies, but how well you do on the labor market is primarily defined by the more generic competencies. There's good evidence showing that how people professionally behave in medical school is predictive for how they will behave in clinical practice. And there's evidence when doctors get into trouble in practice, there were already indications in the medical school. So these kind of skills are important, but very difficult, both to train and to assess. But we need to assess them, and we have to rely on human, expert, professional judgment. Learning impact, the third one. And I think I alluded to that a lot in the beginning as well. I think that we have, we compromise a lot on learning impact. We have a great culture. Also, the students are completely um, targeted to grades. Oh, I passed and skip all the information, go on to the next one. Um, you give grades? Yeah? You don't give grades? Oh, OK, but uh, you know, that's even less information. Huh? So there's no or poor feedback. And then often I see that things become trivialized because we want to objectify them. For example, let me give the example of the OSCE, where we have, for objectivity reasons, have very elaborate checklists. Checklist, tick, 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 huh? objective. But then oftentimes I see the process being trivialized. So a student coming into an OSCE station on communication will immediately, oh, communication, yes. Checklist by heart. Introduce yourself to the, to the patient. Huh? Make your professional relationship clear. And they become monkeys doing tricks. Right? I often see that a lot in assessment, that things are very trivialized. And I think we should prevent that. I see a lot of that sort of trivial learning. Loss of information. I think assessment is the art of throwing away information. First, we have a bunch of scores on stations or on items. And then we average across stations. We lose all the information. And then we hold it against the standard, pass or fail. Again, we lose a lot of information. 
So, you know, assessment is the art of throwing away information, which I think we shouldn't. And then, as I to told you in, the, in my first talk, uh, if we do remediation, uh, if, we do, if you fail a test, we do something very silly, repeat a test, without any further diagnostic information. And if you fail again, repeat the course, without any further diagnostic information or any sort of tailored remedy. There's no remediation. It is simple repetition, which I think is silly. And then what I alluded to um, in, uh, in, 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 in earlier, uh, this is the adagium, assessment driving learning. But unfortunately, this is often the case. Driving non-learning, trivial learning. So we compromise a lot on the learning function of our assessment systems. Right, so we need to remediate that. And now I get to the more abstract part because I'm going to present a model uh, in which we try to combine different functions in such a way that we build up a system which is overall a program which both facilitates information to the learner and allows you to take decisions over learner promotion. Um, so that assessment is purposeful. Huh? It is arranged. The sum is more than a whole. Huh? It's like a curriculum, but now for the assessment. It should be completely aligned to the curriculum mm. objectives. So if you have these fancy outcomes in your education system, your assessment sh system should mirror that. And it should therefore foster learning and decision making. And therefore you combine purposefully the compromises. I will not compromise, for example, on learning impact at this particular moment because I simply want, at this particular moment, the information to be given full reign. I don't care about the reliability of this particular moment. I care about the reliability in terms of combining different moments. OK, the assumptions within the model is quite clear. Every individual method is flawed, OK? Uh, it's in the combination of methods that the strength lies. But the individual method is flawed. How about the distinction of formative and summative? Huh? Um, are you talking about more formative exams? Yes, I am. But I would like to change the, um, the, 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 the lingo here. In my view, pure formative exams, particularly in existence with the summative exam system uh, added to that, are not taken seriously by the students and teachers. And particularly if the goals of the summative and informative do not align, you have a problem. And the formative will not be taken seriously. So in my view, I would like to replace the formative summative distinction into what is at stake. And that is a continuum. And you have very low stake evaluations and very high stake evaluations. OK? And in my view, the number of evaluations, the number of data points, should be proportional to the stakes. So in terms of a high stake decision, we need a lot of evaluations, which is quite clear now from what I had talked about earlier. We need a lot of information in order to make a meaningful decision. If we talk about individual data points, if we talk about a low stake, then it's low stake. And the focus is very much on the meaningfulness of the data. The model is appropriate for student-centered learning. I mean, if you're, if you're only interested in mastery learning, in, like in the old traditional system, then forget about this model. But if you want your students to be trained in these more higher competency frameworks, if you want your students to be more self-directed, take responsibility of their learning, then such a model is appropriate. The model is generic in terms of its focus of training. 
may be applied to school-based situations, to undergraduate training. It may be applied to work-based settings, either undergraduate or postgraduate. It is generic in that sense. Here's the sort of basic uh, framework. Um, I make a distinction in terms of training activities, assessment activities, and supporting activities. And I put them on a time frame. Um, here we have a course or a, a particular period of education. That consists of a bunch of different learning tasks identified as small circuits. Um, it could be a lecture, could be a tutorial, could be an operation, could be um, uh, an assignment of some kind, learning tasks of some kind. Some of these learning tasks, they turn into artifacts. For example, you've written a paper on something, or uh, you've produced a journal of the operation. Um, these learning tasks are arranged in, again, in a modern form. And actually, there are instruction design theories that tell you how to structure these learning tasks. For example, the 4CID model of instruction is a model that uses this. And there are certain you know, rules around designing these learning tasks. Then we have a number of different assessment activities. Um, and I symbolize them as a triangle, right? Miller's, Miller's pyramid. They can be from any sort of method. Any method is appropriate as long as they connect to the education and are really meaningful for the education that is going on. Okay? The individual data points, they are meaningful. They give you feedback. Right? These individual assessments are feedback oriented to stimulate learning. They are low stake. There's even, there might be no pass-fail decision at all. They are oriented towards giving information, towards feedback. Um, they are information rich. Therefore, they're not only quantitative, they're quantitative if, they, if it's possible to be quantitative, or they are qualitative, narrative, descriptive. If you hand in a paper, which is structured according to the scientific principles of writing a paper, you get feedback, narrative feedback, on how you did what should be improved, what you did well, and so on and so forth. OK. Some of these learning moments, or some of these assessment moments, are certification tasks. So there you have to certify. You pass or you fail. For example, resuscitation is such an example. You have to know the procedures. So you practice and you drill until you know the procedures. And then you certify the person for that particular moment. So these are a range of assessment activities. Some of these assessment activities are related to the learning task or to the artifact of the learning task. So the teaching, the learning task, is to write a research proposal. The research proposal is the artifact that is being assessed as well, on which feedback is being given. That research proposal is part of a longitudinal line in the learning tasks arrangement of building up your <coughs> academic skills. And later on, you have to do other art, uh, artifacts and other learning tasks in relation to the development of that particular competency. OK. Now, this is all fed back to the learner. The learner gets the feedback from these evaluation data points. Um, and the learner will reflect on that. How am I doing? Where do I stand? How should I move on? Um, and actually, we know from a lot of the reflection literature that it's not easy to reflect. And we know from the self-directed self learning literature a very paradoxical finding that is in order to have self-direction to work, it needs a lot of direction. And therefore, I think it's important to have 
someone to look over the shoulder of the learner and have someone to talk about how you progress. It's very clear from the research around portfolios, for example, that people hate to reflect, except if it can be done in interaction with someone. So feedback is, I, is, a, is a dialogue. And creating that dialogue, I think, is very, very important. Simply expecting people to reflect and consume information is a dead end. We know from research that 50% of the feedback is simply ignored. So feedback is a dialogue. Right, so I think that with this ongoing learning and ongoing assessment, the learner gets a lot of feedback, knows how to plan and direct his or her learning for the future. Then, at the end of this training period, we have an evaluation, an overall evaluation, which I would call an intermediate evaluation. There it is. In my view, in the intermediate evaluation, we aggregate the information from the past period. We have to aggregate on meaningful entities. So we have, if it's about your academic skills, we have a report on a research report writing over there, a literature exercise there, um, a writing assignment over there, and we combine that information. So it's a longitudinal aggregation of information across um, different assessment information. That is done by a committee of examiners, someone external to the process, someone who is able to take tough decisions if necessary. That decision is diagnostic, what's going on here. It is prognostic, it gives you an advice. And it is um, therapeutic, it, it tells you what to do. And it's prognostic in the sense that if you don't do it, something will happen. The decision that is taken at the intermediate level is of an intermediate stake. It gives you a clear warning, perhaps. Okay? It is not repetition oriented. It is remediation oriented. Very different from the traditional model. Eh? The traditional model is uh, simply retake your test. Here, you get an advice. You have to remediate this or remediate that. Very different model. There's a firewall dilemma because the people knowing best how people progress are the people themselves, the learner and the coach of the learner. However, if you allow the coach to also take the decision of a learning progress, you get a mixture of responsibilities which places the coach in a different light to the learner. And you might actually want to firewall that. So the decision making is done by someone else and not your coach. And your coach is there to help you as much as possible. Right? It's like being a PhD student where you have a supervisor. Your supervisor will help you utmost, but ultimately the decision is with the committee externally. Firewalled. Right. Then this goes on. This goes on uh, with the next period. And you know, I don't know how many periods there are in the training program. That's fully generic. And the same intermediate evaluation repeats itself. And this will uh, repeat itself with another cycle. And then there's a final uh, uh, evaluation. We need to take a high stake decision over learner promotion. Will that learner pass on to the next year, for example? And uh, for example, the one uh, in postgraduate training programs, the end of the first year is the most important one, really. So that's a real high stake decision that needs to be taken. Again, it's done by committee. It is done by looking at the longitudinal performance, holding it against a performance standard, 
which is um, a narrative from the competencies. So you have a performance standard against, you, against which you hold the longitudinal performance, and you take a decision. Um, the high-stake decision will be based on a lot of rich information and on a lot of data points. Okay? Um, so actually, you can make a solid decision here because you have a lot of information from a lot of different sources, from a lot of different evaluations. It's high stake. So you better make sure about that decision. Because it's still judgment. It might be biased. And we need to take measures against that bias. For example, let me give you an example. Um, the size of the committee will matter. I've seen an implementation in the US where the committee consists of 15 people in a system which was completely firewalled. Well, nobody has those resources. But you know, the committee size will matter. For 90% of the decisions, the committee will decide very quickly. But for a few percent, they will take a long time. They will deliberate. And they will justify their decision. They will motivate their decision. That makes it more trustworthy, doesn't it, if you do that? It makes it more trustworthy if the, the cycle of feedback has worked. If the outcome of the final examination, uh, final evaluation would be a total surprise to the learner, something must have gone wrong in the process. Okay? So these measures, they actually stem from, I get my inspiration from, um, from qualitative research. Like in quantitative research, there are certain strategies to make your data robust and your decisions robust. And these are a bunch of different strategies that can be applied in order to make global, holistic judgment trustworthy, credible, right? So instead of objectifying everything, which would be the standard approach to assessment, we leave global what needs to be left global. We need to assess higher order competencies, which have to rely on expert judgment. And in order to overcome the biases, we need a lot of expert judgments. And we need to come to overall decisions that are based on a set of procedural measures which build credibility to the system. Right. I think I see you all with glazy eyes. What is he talking about? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, very abstract, isn't it? Let's make it more concrete. Um, there are a couple of practical examples, but I use the one from Maastricht because that's most familiar to me. I'll show you what we do. We have a four-year graduate entry program into medicine. Huh? So that is a a medical program in which we take in graduates who have done a previous bachelor or master degree. And then we give them a four-year graduate entry program, a four-year medical training program, with on top of their medical uh, training, they get a research award. So they also have a master of science in clinical research. Pretty tough program. It is competency-based, and we use the KenMets models, the Canadian uh, outcome-based uh, system, and uh, it is a PBL program. That is, first year is classic PBL, second year is uh, patient-based PBL, third year rotations, fourth year participation, half a year participation in one healthcare setting of their des desire, and half a year of research. Um, and we have high expectations. We expect a lot from the students. It's not a 25-hour working week that we expect from the students. We expect a lot of them. The assessment program consists of a number of different elements uh, with embedded module assessments, um, 
either looking at more knowledge elements or looking at more behavioral elements like how they professionally behave in the tutorial groups, how they professionally behave towards simulated patients, real patients, and so on. Um, so these are module based. But then we have a set of longitudinal exams, like for example, the progress test, which was the written exam, which we give periodically to all the students, four times a year. We also have module exceeding skills and professional behavior evaluations across, across the units, longitudinally. And then we have a system of counselors who sort of coaches who guide the students. Um, here's an example of how we give feedback. We pay a lot of attention to giving feedback to students. Here's feedback on the progress test. Every three months you have a new progress test and you'll find yourself growing on that test. And here's a third year student who finds himself growing on that test. Now this is not the greatest student. This is the scores of the student. This is the red line, which is the danger area. Something must have happened after the 10 progress tests, and then they probably started to work. So from the longitudinal performance, the computer can actually generate future performance. But you can also, this is the total score. They can look at their anatomy scores, or their physiology scores, or their internal medicine score, or their total basic science score. That's all up to them, and the computer will generate all that information longitudinally and how you perform to the rest of the class and actually to the rest of the country. So a vast system of information. This is one of the examples that we give in the uh, electronic portfolio that we use uh, when the students are in the clinical rotations. This is for a multi-source feedback, a 360 judgment uh, of a group of people judging the individual over the last couple of months, and the computer will generate quantitative outcomes. It will, this is a, an example of a set of work-based assessments using mini C axis. You can, you can look at the performance longitudinally. You can also click, for example, this is a low one. You can click on that, get the specific information and the narrative information that was associated with this particular point. So we spend a lot of effort and we use the computers a lot to give students feedback. It's very feedback oriented. Then there are the counselors, um, which monitor the students very closely. They have access to all the feedback, and they have periodic meetings with the students. Students have to reflect on where they are, where they're going, have to make plans. And then there's the decision making by the committee. There's a committee of uh, a group of people. We took an intermediate firewall decision because in our case, the committee consists of the counselors themselves, but the counselors may not make a decision. It's up to the other counselors. And actually, I'm part of one of these committees, not simply because I'm a counselor, but because I'm there to ask nasty questions. My role is to ask nasty questions. Sorry. So that is done by the committee. This leads to, uh, and everything is formative. Huh? So, you know, you can't fail individual evaluation moments. You have to show progression. And if you look at some of the data that we get from this program, if you look at the performance of the, of the end of for year four graduate medical students, uh, sorry, over there, if you compare that to our six-year medical training program, undergraduate regular training programs, the differences are pretty large. I mean, we're talking about uh, about one standard deviation of an effect size, one, an effect size of one, really, where these students outperform the traditional model. So even also in the absence of the traditional summative system, you can produce graduates which do really well, uh, in this case, on the progress test. The students are very information oriented. They want the feedback. Right. Conclusion. Um, in my view, the programmatic assessment approach combin combines both the function of learning 
And if you do that appropriately, you will get a lot of meaningful information along the way, which you can then use for robust decision making over time. It's generic in nature, and it may be applied at all levels of the training continuum. However, the, it is not easy to implement because the people in the, working in the assessment program, the teachers, they should be aware of the function of um, them in the program. I had a lot of discussions with individual teachers who said, I want to pass or fail my students. And my answer is, your task is not to pass fail students. Your answer is to give information, which is a, you know, a very fundamental discussion you have with your teachers. And then getting the, the, the information, getting the, the, the feedback is a challenge. It's very difficult for staff to give feedback on things. No time, you know, uh, or simply hold up a, a thumb, you're all right. Huh? So this is the challenge. The challenge is to get the appropriate feedback and to get your staff to engage in such an activity. That is the biggest challenge if you go to this approach. Thank you very much.